I have a particular interest in uh, Kate's work, of course, because there's a Scottish background to much of the folklore which she uses. So um, my bedtime reading recently, uh, or past few months, has been The Witches of Elian. 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 The Witches of Elian. Um, but Kate tells me that these are uh, earlier works, her more recent works. Uh, her latest book is Bitter Greens, which I think is on sale here. Uh, it's all sold out, sorry, guys. It's all sold out. The book I've been trying to get my hands on, of which she brought me a copy, is uh, The Puzzle Rig, based on Scottish folklore, she tells me. And her <coughs> latest project is most interesting. It's a novel based on the life of Doctrine Vilt, the girl who told the Grimm brothers many of the most compelling tales. So I'm really looking forward to this. Thank you so much for coming to us today. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, and thank you for all being here. Um, look. I have always wanted to be a writer. I, I cannot remember a time when it wasn't the total sum of my heart's longing. Maybe this is because books have always been so important to me in my life. Books were like a magical, magical gateway that would take me away to other times and other lands. And for a while there, I would stop being me and I would be somebody else. And I would have grand adventures, I would suffer, I would love. I would dream, and when I came back to my own self, a young girl in a, a suburb of Sydney, I would be enlarged somehow. I would have grown, I would have changed as a consequence of the adventures that I had had within the covers of a book. So maybe I wanted to be a writer so badly so I could recapture that sense of enchantment. Or maybe it's because writing and storytelling is in my blood. I'm actually the great, 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 great granddaughter of the woman who, f who first wrote the children, sorry, who wrote the first children's book published in Australia. Mm -hmm. It was published 171 years ago, and it's one of the great lost stories of Australian history. It's a story of love and loss and grief, mm -hmm. violence, madness, mm -hmm. and triumph against overwhelming odds. I'm going to tell you that story today. My great-great-great-grandmother was called Charlotte Waring, and she was born here in England. She actually lived in Richmond, on the River Thames. She was born into a life of luxury and privilege. She, she lived in a grand house filled with artworks and beautiful objects. Her father was a very rich and very eccentric gentleman. She had everything a little girl could want. She had ponies, she had servants, and don't we all want servants? <laughs> she actually had her own private zoo in the grounds of her garden because her father used to collect exotic animals and he had the largest private zoo in the world. And this is how Charlotte Waring grew up. But when she was 15 years old, her father remarried a young woman who was only three years older than Charlotte and within a couple of years had had a little boy. And when Charlotte's father died, Everything, the money, the artworks, the ponies, the servants, the private zoo, everything was left in trust to that little boy, not yet two years old. And Charlotte and her sisters were left with nothing. They had to go and work as governesses. It's a, just like a Charlotte Bronte story. Mm -hmm. Well, Charlotte Waring, my great-great-great-grandmother, she hated being a governess. She was used to having servants waiting on her. She was headstrong unruly and hot-tempered. As you can imagine, she was sacked, <coughs> she was sacked, and she was sacked again, even though she was exceptionally well-educated for her time. One day, Charlotte saw an advertisement in the London Times offering £100 a year as a governess. £100, that was four times what she was then earning. Charlotte thought, what could I do with a hundred pounds a year? I could save up. Maybe one day I could stop working as a governess and make a life of my own. So of course she applied for the job. But when she turned up at the Grand London Hotel where the interviews were being held, it was to find 24 other governesses all lined up in a row in their button-up boots and their high-necked blouses, all wanting that hundred pounds a year for themselves. One by one they went in. And one by one they came out going, you must be mad! <laughs> it's not worth a hundred pounds a year to do that! <laughs> Charlotte thought, what do 
I have to do to get my hundred pounds a year? <laughs> when she went in for the interview, she found out. The job was as a governess to the MacArthur family in far off New South Wales. Now Charlotte, she read the papers. She heard about Sydney, New South Wales. It was where they sent all the convicts. It's where they had those smallpox epidemics. Taxed by violent natives. Escaped convicts turned bushrangers. It was where there were all those weird animals that looked like they'd been invented by a mad scientist. You know, a duck <laughs> stuck on a, uh, an otter. <laughs> Charlotte was a very brave young woman. She said, I will take the job, but I must travel first class. <laughs> <laughs> the night before Charlotte left England forever, because people didn't come back very often from the colonies, she went home to that big, beautiful house at Richmond on the River Thames to say goodbye to her stepmother and her young brother and her sisters. And that night, Charlotte walked out into the garden and she listened to the lap, lap, lap of the River Thames and she thought, I will never hear the Thames again. She looked up at the stars. She thought, I will never see these stars again. They have different constellations on the other side of the world. And with tears in her eyes, she bent down and she picked up off the ground, off the banks <coughs> of the river, a small brown pebble. And she slipped that small brown pebble into her pocket. It was a symbol of where she came from and why she was leaving her homeland forever. She wanted to make a new life for herself. And so this small brown pebble, it was a symbol of hope, courage, faith in the future. Now at first it seemed as if all Charlotte's dreams would come true. Because on board that ship that was going to take her from Portsmouth <coughs> to Sydney, well as she was standing there with her new employers, up the gangplank came a very young and very handsome young man and he tipped his hat to her, a bit of a wink. Within seven days they were engaged to be married. <laughs> <laughs> that young and handsome man, his name was James Atkinson and he was the most eligible young bachelor in the colonies. He'd gone to Sydney to work in the general surveyor's office and he had just been granted the largest land grant in New South Wales. Huge, huge acres of rich arable land. He'd actually just, he'd come back to London in order to publish his book, which was called An Account of the State of Agriculture in New South Wales. It's an incredibly boring book. <laughs> but it's actually extremely important in Australian literary history. James and Charlotte were in love. <sighs> it caused a huge scandal for James Atkinson, the richest, most eligible young bachelor to marry a mere governess. <gasps> the shock, the horror. But they were in love, they were married, and they moved to his estate. And there they built a beautiful sandstone mansion that they called Oldbury, which was named after James's father's estate in Kent. Actually, Old Berry Farm, the original one, is not 80 miles from where we sit today. <coughs> they were ha very happy. They had four children. Charlotte Elizabeth, named after her mother. Emily. James John, named after his father. And Louisa. But when Louisa was not yet six weeks old, tragedy struck. James Atkinson drank water that had not been boiled. He was dead within three days. And Charlotte was left alone on this vast property at the edge of the wilderness, a property that was run by convicts. There was not another white woman within two days drive. And she had four children under the age of six. <coughs> I tell you what, it was a dangerous time to be a woman alone in New South Wales. She struggled on for a while, but one day she was out riding with her overseer, a man called George Barton when they were attacked by bushrangers. They were dragged off their horses, they were beaten up. In fact, George Barton was whipped till his back was nothing but bloody rags. The head bushranger, who was called John Lynch, 
he said to him, We think it our duty to teach all you gentlemen what it's like to be flogged. We don't know what the bush rangers did to Charlotte. She never spoke of that day again. What we do know is that two weeks later she married George Barton, the man who'd been whipped. We don't know if she married him because she was afraid. A white woman alone in the bush. We don't know if she married him to avoid a scandal. Her name was already overshadowed by scandal. She, was she trying to protect her children? We don't know if George Barton blackmailed her into marrying him by threatening to tell the world what had happened to her that day that she was attacked by bush rangers. What we do know is that it was a terrible mistake. George Barton was a violent drunk. And the moment that she married him, Charlotte handed over her legal right to him because this was in the 1830s in Sydney, New South Wales, and women had little rights at all. Now, a year or two later, Charlotte couldn't take it anymore. She packed up her four children, she packed up her writing desk, put it on the back of a bullock, she packed up a few sticks of furniture and the clothes that they stood in, she packed up her children's pet koala, <laughs> and she took her jewellery box in which she kept a small brown pebble. <clears throat> and she fled at night through the dangerous gorges of the Shoalhaven River, leaving Oldbury Farm in the hands of her drunk, violent husband. She made it to Sydney after many, many adventures. And there she applied to the trustees of the farm, because when her husband had died, when James Atkinson died, everything was left in trust for James John in a strange echo of what had happened to her when she was 15 years old. She applied to the trustees so they would pay her some kind of uh, uh, you know, money every month so that she could feed and clothe and educate her children and send for the doctor when they were sick. But the trustees said, no, we're not going to pay you any money in view of your improvident marriage to George Barton. And then they said, and obviously you're not a fit mother. We apply to the courts to have your four children taken away from you, put in the hands of you know, some man they don't know, a, a legal guardian. Charlotte said, you shall not take my children. For the next six years, she battled through the courts to keep her own children and to get some kind of money. And because they were literally starving, at night she drew those four little children around her. She sat by the fire and she told them stories stories about the history of Australia, stories about those weird animals that were made by some mad scientist, stories about her homeland, stories that created a sense, an enchanted circle, where those children of hers felt safe and loved and connected <coughs> to the past. On the 21st of July, 1841, the New South Wales Supreme Court found in favour of Charlotte Waring and gave her custody of her own children. It's a landmark battle for women's rights in Australian legal history. It's called Atkinson versus Barton. And if you Google it, you'll find out that during the course of this legal battle, Charlotte was at one point put in contempt of court for calling the judge a stupid old bat. <laughs> <laughs> The trustees, however, refused to pay her any money. And so on the 23rd of December, 1841, Charlotte published that collection of stories that she told her children over the last six years. It was called A Mother's Offering to Her Children, published anonymously by a lady long resident in New South Wales. It was an instant bestseller, and with the proceeds from that book, the first children's book published in Australia, she was able to support her children, to feed and clothe them and educate them till James John was finally old enough to inherit Oldbury Farm at the age of 21. Now, when Charlotte died, her daughter, Charlotte Elizabeth, my great-great-great-grandmother, 
found in her jewellery box the small brown pebble that she had picked up so long ago on the banks of the River Thames. And she remembered how her mother used to sit there and hold the pebble in her hands and try and draw strength from it. Try and remember why she'd given up so much and why she travelled this journey to where she was now. It always gave her strength. It always gave her courage. And so Charlotte Elizabeth had that stone mounted on a chain, much like this one. And she wore it all of her life. And when she died, that bracelet was inherited by her daughter, Flora. And Flora married and had children of her own, and she added more charms to that bracelet. And when Flora died, the bracelet was inherited by her daughter, who was called Sarah Mabel. And Sarah Mabel, in turn, died, and the bracelet was then inherited <coughs> by her daughter, Elvira. And Elvira was an amazing woman. She used to travel the world. She never married. She was one of the first women in Australia to ever get a degree. And she travelled all over the world. And everywhere she went, she bought a charm that she added to that bracelet. And Elvira was my great aunt Bobby. If you'd been saddled with a name like Elvira, <laughs> you might like my great aunt Bobby. At the age of 20, she was actually called Baby all of her life because she was the youngest child in the family. She said, please, let's turn Baby into Bobby. So she's called Bobby all of her life. My great aunt Bobby, I used to go and visit her as a little girl and I'd sit on her lap and she would wear this charm bracelet which was heavy with charms. And she would tell me all the stories of her adventures and the charms that her mother and her grandmother and her great grandmother had added to that bracelet. But my favourite story was always that of the first charm, the small brown pebble that my great 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 grandmother picked up so long ago. <laughs> for a book that I wrote 25 years after that. This book is called The Gypsy Crown, and I thought I'd talk about it today because it's actually set here, or, or very close to here, in Kent and Surrey in Sussex. And it tells the story of two Romney children, two gypsy children, in the time of Oliver Cromwell, who set out on a, a mad quest to find five lost gypsy charms with which they hoped to save their family from the gallows. Now, obviously, the initial inspiration for me was charm bracelets, because when my great-aunt Bobby died, that charm bracelet was inherited by my mother, and she owns it still. And I would have liked to have brought it to show it to you today, but apart from the fact that it's very valuable, my mother thinks I'm still a child. <laughs> you could not be entrusted with the family charm bracelet. And so you just need to imagine it in your <laughs> mind's eye. What I loved about the charm bracelet, my great aunt Bobby's charm bracelet, is that each of the stories connected me to the past. And each of the charms connected me to someone in my family. And they made them seem like living people, like real people to me. And I can now go on and tell those stories to my own children. And if you're wondering of who's going to inherit the charm bracelet when my mother dies, well, all I need to, have to tell you is that I have an elder sister. <laughs> <laughs> it's very unfair, isn't it? Now, with the Gypsy Crown, I began simply with wanting to tell a story about a charm bracelet, where every single charm on the bracelet had some kind of meaning, had some kind of power. Not even perhaps a magical power, a power like courage or compassion, strength. And so that's how I began. But how <coughs> I went on and turned it into a story about 17th century gypsy stories, well, you might have to go to my website and read the rest of the stories on that. But what I generally find is that to write a novel, I, I, I need not one idea, but three ideas. And those three ideas need to have some kind of electrical charge so when you put two ideas together, they either repel each other 
violent and you go, oh no, they don't belong in the same book. Or there's some kind of click and you go, yes, I can use that. I thought for Bill's sake, I'll talk a little bit about this book, The Puzzling. Because like many of my books, this book draws upon another part of my family. The story of the charm bracelet comes through my mother's father's family. And the Scottish law and the Scottish connection comes through my mother's mother's family. Now, my grandmother, who we called Nonny, her name was Joy, her grandmother, so my grandmother's grandmother, came to Australia in the 1820s. All right? She was an immigrant from Scotland. And with her, she brought only a trunk with a few clothes, a sprig of heather, and her strawies. And she passed her stories down, mother to daughter, mother to son, until they reached me. Now, my parents split up when I was a little girl. I guess I would have been about eight or nine. And my mother had to work full time. And I don't know if you have immensely long school holidays here in England, but we do in Australia. In Australia, our summer holidays are two months long. And what's a working mother meant to do? So my mother sent my sister, my brother and I, to stay with our great aunts or my grandmother. And they used to entertain us by telling stories. Now, the story of the puzzle wing, I'm actually wearing the puzzle wing, so if you're interested, you can come up and have a look at it later. It's a ring that uh, looks like a quite an intricate and beautiful ring on your finger. But when you pull it off, it falls apart into a number of separate loops, like this. Can you see that? Mm. Now, the story of the puzzle wing was the first thing that got me going. Basically, the first puzzle ring was invented in long, long ago in Arabia when there was a king who fell in love, madly in love, with a beautiful young woman. And he wanted to marry her, but he was insanely jealous. And so he wanted to know if she was ever unfaithful to him. So the king called the court jeweler to him and said, I want you to make me a ring that if the queen ever takes it off her finger, I will know. The court jeweler said, but sire, that's impossible, that's black magic. And the king <coughs> said, you have to <coughs> dawn, else you <coughs> die. What's the court jeweler to do? Of course, he spent all night trying to come up with a ring that would tell if it had ever been taken off the finger. And he thought he had a stroke of genius, a ring like a puzzle. And if you own only the person that knows the secret code to put in the bit, ring back together again, will you know, be able to put it back on their finger. So at dawn, he carries it into the throne room and says, Sire, I've done it, here it is. And the king made him show him again and again and again the secret code of putting the ring back together again. And when the king had mastered it, well, of course, what did he do? Of course, he killed the court jeweler. <laughs> he wanted to be the only man to know the secret of the puzzle ring. And in time, the queen, of course, took the ring off her finger. I take mine off when I'm going to garden, so I don't get it all clogged with dirt. I take it off when I'm cleaning silver, so it doesn't get all tarnished, yucky stuff on it. I doubt the queen ever had to clean silver. <laughs> I doubt she ever gardened. But for some reason, she took the ring off her finger, and of course, she couldn't, could not put it back again. And the king found her there, sobbing, desperately trying to work out how to put the four broken loops of the puzzle ring back together again. And of course we know the ending of the story, don't we? <laughs> Absolutely. So that was what began. That was the first idea. And then my second idea was inspired by a famous Scottish curse called the Seaforth Curse. And if we had a whole evening together, I would tell you the story of the Seaforth Doom. It's one of the greatest curse stories of all, and really good for scaring young children into being good. <laughs> <laughs> However, I'm going to tell you the story that my own grandmother used to tell me about Mary, Queen of Scots. The Puzzle Ring is a time travel story. It's about a contemporary girl who discovers her family is cursed, and the only way to break the curse is to put back together a broken puzzle ring. And to do this, she must travel back in time to the day that the ring was broken and find the four lost pieces. 
It's a classic quest story. You might have noticed I love quests. <laughs> now, I could have picked any period in history to send my modern day girl back to, but I chose the time, the perilous days of Mary, Queen of Scots, and that's because of this story that my grandmother used to tell me. Now, how much do you know about Mary, Queen of Scots? You know that she was Queen of Scotland in the mid-16th century, no doubt. Did you know that she became Queen when she was only six days old? Her father died, they say a brief, after a desperate battle and loss to Henry VIII, that I think was Solway Fir. They waited till she was nine months old before they crowned her because she had to be able to sit up. But the crown they forged for her is only this big. And they made her a little cloak, a red velvet about this big, all lined with ermine for her to wear. They crowned her. And so she was Queen of Scotland, practically from the day she was born. But of course, did you really want to be an enemy of King Henry VIII? <laughs> Henry VIII wanted Scotland. I won't say Lord knows why. <laughs> you don't want to offend any Scots amongst us. <clears throat> it's this beautiful, mysterious country. Henry VIII wanted it, so he sent armies in. You know, bombing the castles, killing the Scottish warriors, and trying to steal the young princess. So much so that at the age of five, she was sent across to France, where she lived for the next 11 or 12 years. She actually married the Dauphin, the French prince, when she was 16 and he was 15. And when his father died, she was not only Queen of Scotland, but also Queen of France. And at the urging of her advisers, she also declared herself Queen of England, which didn't please her cousin, Mary Tudor, at all, or her other cousin, Elizabeth Tudor, at all. Tudors have long memories <laughs> that for one or two brief years, she was the most powerful and the most beautiful woman in the world, Queen of Scotland, England and France, until her, her husband, her best friend died. Now, does anyone here know what Francois I died of? Did he fall off the horse? No, his father died because he was jousting and his, with his best friend and the jouse splintered on the saddle and drove up through his eye. That's how his father died. Francois I died of an earache. And in those days, the, the cure for an earache was to stick a roasted onion in your ear <laughs> and then to bleed you till you felt better. Francois I of France died of blood loss at the age of 17. Oh, doesn't it make you glad that we don't live in this <laughs> Anyway, once her husband had died, Mary was packed up and sent back to Scotland. She was 19 years old, hadn't seen Scotland since she was five, didn't speak the language, thought of herself as the Queen of France, and then she was packed off, off to Scotland. And of course, no one was very happy about this, so there was one uprising after another. And Mary, in her infinite wisdom, I never said she was smart, decided if she married, perhaps her people would stop rising up against her. And she chose as her next husband, her cousin, who was actually also her heir, the heir to the throne. And this, of course, I seem to have this theme of foolish marriages going on today, don't I? It was a big mistake. Lord Henry Darnley, he gambled, he partied, he was uh, generally not a very nice person, and he wanted the throne for himself. And he begged Mary to name him king, but she wouldn't. She was the Queen of Scotland. He was simply her prince consort, and she would not name him king. I want you to imagine a chilly March morning. Mary is seven months pregnant with the future king of Scotland, and she's having supper in her tower room at Holyrood Palace with a few friends, including her, her closest friend, an Italian musician that she had raised up to be her secretary. When suddenly the door is bashed down and 36 great lords of Scotland charge into her room with bared swords and they stab to death David Rizzio, one blow for each of the 36 conspirators. 
Blood sprays all over Mary, and David falls at her feet, clawing at her skirts, begging her to help him. 36 stab wounds, there's not a chance in hell she can help him. He dies there in a puddle of blood on her bedroom floor. And then Lord Henry Darnley holds his sword to Mary's throat. She's covered in the blood of her best friend and says, name me king, else you will die too. And she says, how can you say so? I'm, I'm bearing your child. And he says, name me king, else you die and I'll, I'll be king anyway. Mary said, I can't think. I need time. What can I do? She said, give me till morning. And so Lord Henry Dunley said, you have till dawn. They dragged David Rizzio out of her room, leaving a smear of blood on her floor and tossing down the stairs and they locked the door and she's locked there in her bloodstained clothes, trying to think what she can do. She may not have been clever, but she was very brave. Mary tied together all her bedclothes and seven months pregnant, she climbed out the window of her tower, down the side, four stories high it is, I've been there, crept to the stables, managed to saddle a horse for the first time in her life and galloped off into the night. And a week later, she marched back into Edinburgh at the head of an army. She took back her palace, she took back her throne, and she threw those 36 conspirators into jail, including, of course, her own husband. Now, if you know the Mary Queen of Scots Scot story, you will know that in time she let him out. They never really made friends again. <laughs> Nine months later, he was, the place where he was living in Edinburgh was blown to smithereens, and Lord Henry Darnley's body was found half naked and strangled to death in the garden. And as a consequence of this crime, Mary fought and fought, but failed to subdue her outraged subjects. She was forced <coughs> to abdicate. She married again in the meantime, I should add. And her son, her 10-month-old son, James VI of Scotland, was crowned. And Mary fled to England, where she spent the next 20-odd years imprisoned by her cousin, Elizabeth Judah. But what interests me about this story Remember the blood stain on the floor of Mary's bedchamber? It is still there. <laughs> I've been to Edinburgh, I've been to Hollywood Palace, and I have seen it. 440 years later, no amount of scrubbing will ever wash that blood stain away. I know the cynical ones among you think they get out every morning and paint it on the floorboards. <laughs> That's what my father used to say. My mother used to say, it's a natural discoloration in the timber. <laughs> I have been to Holyrood Palace. I have seen the stain of treachery and murder. It is still there. <laughs> and that is it. <laughs> Because of that story that I used to love my grandmother telling me it used to give me real little shivers, that is why the puzzle ring is set in Scotland, and that is why it's set during the time of Mary, Queen of Scots. Now, I have travelled 17,000 kilometres to be with you here today. So, and I have written 20 books. 25 books, I actually think I'm up to now. They've been published in 13 different <coughs> languages around the world. I would have loved to have brought all these books to show you, but I was only allowed 20 kilograms. <laughs> and as you can see, my latest book pretty much takes up a fair amount of space in my luggage. So I've only brought these three books to, to talk to you about. Bit of Greens is a retelling of the Rapunzel fairy tale. All right, A tale that we all think we know think, don't you? One of the things that drew me, that drew me first to writing the story, was the fact that I had always been haunted by the Rapunzel fairy tale. Much like the prince in the story is haunted by the maiden in the tower singing. The Grimm fairy collection was first given to me as a little girl when I was in hospital. 
the age of seven. I was actually, um, I was attacked by a dog when I was two. I was only a toddler, just beginning to walk and talk, and the dog was a Doberman. I want you to imagine its jaws. The bottom jaw kind of went straight through here, and the top jaw went straight to the back. And in the process of savaging me and subjecting me over the next eight years to continual hospital vi uh, visits, the dog destroyed my tear duct, which meant that as a child growing up, I was unable to control my tears. I wept all the time. Now the tear duct's function in the body is to wash away the dirt, filth, and the germs out of your eye. And because I didn't have a tear duct, that meant all that filth, all those germs and dust deposited themselves in my eye, which meant that I was half blind, in fever, chronically ill. And it was at that stage that I first met Rapunzel. And I don't know how well you know the motifs. I'm sure you know it's a girl locked in a tower. I'm sure you know that she has impossibly long hair. I'm sure you know that a witch, that a, a witch has imprisoned her there and a prince rides past, hears her singing and climbs up the braid and they fall in love. Do you remember that when the witch discovers their love affair, she casts Rapunzel out into the wilderness and then the prince is thrown from the tower and he is blinded by the thorns at the base of the tower. And Rapunzel finds him and weeps upon his eyes and heals him. Now I want you to imagine me as a little girl, seven years old. I was in the Sydney Eye Hospital, which is normally full of old people having their cataracts fixed. They have a children's ward that is empty except for me, in a little bed by the window. And day after day after day, I would lie there staring out the window, and all I could see was the green slope of the hill, a Morton Bay fig tree, which looks like the magic bar of a tree. Google it, they're amazing trees. And the wall of a sandstone building that looked like a castle. And so I used to imagine myself galloping up that hill and my horse would spread wings and fly off into the sky and I'd be free to have a ma magical and marvellous adventures. So for a little girl being given the story of Rapunzel, about a girl whose tears save and heal, where my tears were the cause of intense pain and fever. A girl who escaped her imprisonment when I was unable to do so. I had a drip in my arm. I couldn't even get up and walk around. I think that is why Rapunzel has haunted me all of my life. So I began by wanting to retell the Rapunzel fairy tale. But I wanted to tell it as if it was true, as if it had really happened, as if it was living history. Now, nowadays when we read in the papers or watch on the TV about a young girl who is kidnapped and locked away from the world, I'm sure immediately a number of different present day examples leap into your mind. What do we think is the kidnapper's desire? What does the kidnapper want? with a little girl. It always puzzled me that people think of Rapunzel as being a story about thwarted mother love. I never saw it that way. But I thought, if I want to tell the story as if it really happened, I'd like to go back, go back to the very origin of the story, find out who first told the story. And that in, set me off on a, a journey that has lasted me about seven years. Because along the way, I found out so much that I didn't know before. I found out, for example, that one of the earliest <coughs> versions of Rapunzel is actually, actually Petrucinella, told by the Italian fairy tale writer Gian Battista Basile, Neapolitan, who was serving the Venetian Republic as a soldier at the time he wrote the tale. Venice. <laughs> Venice. <laughs> what a fantastic place to tell a Rapunzel tale. All those towers and secret walled gardens, and narrow alleyways, and skullduggery, canals, stinking canals, oh, perfect. But it, it wasn't the version of the story that spoke most to me. In, in Basile's version, the princess sings, she's not a princess, of course, she's a poor girl <coughs> whose parents sold her after stealing parsley from the witch's garden. 
So the girl, the imprisoned girl, sings. The prince hears her, climbs the braid, but then they escape the tower with the help of three magical objects, in this case, Gornas. And they fling them behind them as they run, and one turns into a lion, and one turns into a boar, and one turns into a, a wolf, who devours the witch so that the girl and the prince can escape. But see, I love the version with the healing tears. So I thought, well, who told that tale? And that is how I stumbled upon the fascinating story of Charlotte Rose de la Force, who is the woman who first wrote the tale as we know it. She was a 17th century French writer. She was second cousin to the Sun King, Louis XIV. And when she was my age, the same age that I am now, young and vibrant, <laughs> she was sent to a convent by the king, and you must know that she was a Huguenot, a French Protestant, sent to a convent for her wild and wicked ways. But what did Charlotte Rose do to deserve being locked away in the convent? Living death to a young and vibrant woman like Charlotte Rose. She had an affair with an actor, it was one thing. She tried to use black magic to ensnare herself a husband, <laughs> another point in her history. But my favorite tale was, she, she had a much younger lover. She was 32 and he was 25. And his parents thought that she'd ensnared him with her wicked wiles. And so they locked him away in their family castle. And to gain access to him, Charlotte Rose hired a travelling troupe of actors and, and performers. And she dressed herself up as a dancing bear. <laughs> <laughs> to gain access to him, this is true. This is one of the most well-known anecdotes about Charlotte Rose. I thought a woman who dresses up as a dancing bear to gain access to her much younger lover, my kind of woman. <laughs> <laughs> and that began my fascination with Charlotte Rose, which has ended up in, as you can see, quite a large book. Charlotte Rose wrote Personet, which was her version of, of Rapunzel, when she was locked up in that convent. And the parallel between the young and vital woman locked up in a convent and the young girl locked up in a tower was symbolically, I think, quite powerful. And what I love about Charlotte Rose's story is that she published her collection of fairy stories under the uh, pseudonym Mademoiselle X, the original Madame X. And they were such a success that she was in time able to buy her way free and return to the Parisian social life. So, you can see from the stories that I have told you today um, a number of recurring themes. One is, I guess, stories told to me by older women in my family. The first would be my great aunt Bobby, the second would be my great aunts and my grandmother. And the third, although she was one of my family, I feel such a strong connection to her. The third was told by another woman who is forgotten to history. I feel like I have rescued Charlotte Rose from a kind of oubliette. <laughs> We all know the name of Charles Perrault, but do, how many of us actually know the names of the French fairy tale writers who were, you know, the female, who were incredibly um, witty and funny and daring and subversive in the time of the Sun King? To me, story is, I think, one of the most powerful things that we have as human beings. It is what, one of the things that actually makes us human. Story performs so many important functions in our society. With story, we can be connected to the past, not just the past of our own family, but to the entire past of humanity. Our ancestors, when they used to crouch among, uh, around a campfire, it was stories that they told to keep away the terrors of the night. Stories of heroes and monsters and quests stories of what was right and what was wrong and the dangers that lay ahead for those that transgressed the rules. Stories help us think. Stories help us feel. Stories help us make sense of who we are. Stories are how we explain ourselves to others and how we connect to others. Most importantly of all, stories make us think in ways that no other human activity does. Ezra Pound said that 
A man reading should be a man intensely alive. The book should be a ball of light in his hands. What Ezra Pound didn't know is that about 100 years after he wrote that, uh, you know, physiobiologists put things on people's head and do MRI scans that show what happens to us when we <coughs> read. And our brains are like balls of light. What we experience by reading is as true to us as what we actually experience in real life. When we read about an old man's leathery hand, the part of our brain that would light up if we touch leather lights up when we're reading about it. When we read about tasting honey, the part of our brain that lights up when we taste lights up when we're reading about it. Reading books and telling stories are, I think, the most important thing that we do that makes us human. Now, I, I have two things that I would like to share with you. One is a favourite quote of mine from Tolkien. He says, Pay <coughs> no heed to the tales of old wives. It may well be that they alone keep in memory what was once needful for the wise to know. I think that's very true. And this one is from Jane Yolen. Hero of mine. Jane Yolen says, to do without stories and tales and books is to lose humanity's past and to have no star map for the future. Mm, good, isn't it? <laughs> so on that note, I'd like to finish. I think I'm probably almost out of time. But I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you.
but I know from personal experience that it's very difficult for us to get hold of Australian books. Bishopon.com.au. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually very easy and it's cheap as well. So, of course, Australian books are much more expensive than UK books, and I know that is what turns people off. But um, Fishpond.com.au is the American, is the Australian um, yeah. Amazon. So what, what was my question? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, what, what was your sort of growing up experience? Were, were you mainly immersed in the UK mm. based storytelling line from your, yes. obviously from your family, but yes. what were you actually reading? Absolutely. Um, as a child growing up, all of my, nearly all of my reading were English writers. And this is a universal experience of most Australian of my generation. Um, I read um, Enid Blyton and Susan Cooper and Joan Aiken <coughs> and um, you know school books and pony books, and most of them um, were set in England, which is why I get really excited when I see primrose. <laughs> you know, because I you know they were in every book, and I never knew what a primrose looked like, and I got so excited. Oh, are they are primrose yellow? Yeah. Um, you know, we had wonderful writers in Australia, writers like Patricia Wrightson, who you might have heard of, and I, I certainly read her books, but um, she was a lone voice. The majority of my reading was actually set in, in England. Rosemary Sutcliffe, for example, you know, Geoffrey Treese. Um, uh, my favourite reading as a child was always history and fantasy, and, uh, and it, it, it all came out of England. My, my personal sort of push at the moment is for my local libraries to get hold of more Australian writers. For example, I'm afraid the name of the author escapes me. The, the, the series of Tomorrow series? Uh, tomorrow when the war began? Uh, I'm John Marsden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I've managed to get them to buy three of them so far. Yeah, things are very different in Australia now than they were, they were when I was growing up. Um, you know, now Australian publishers are publishing Australian authors and there's a very lively um, seen in Australia, but there certainly wasn't, you know, there was not much being published when I was, when I was growing up. It was only when I went over to Australia that I was introduced to um, the Sword, Crown and Ring. Uh, Ruth Park. Ruth Park, yes. Mm. And Ruth Park wrote a wonderful book which you might know called Plain Beaky Bow, mm. um, which is, was a, t a time slip story set in the rocks, and that was the first time I ever read, uh, read a book that I wanted to read, you know, magic, time travel, history, set in Australia. Mm. Are we out of time? Thank you so much. <laughs>